After weeks of anticipation that Washington and Pyongyang may soon revive engagement and return to denuclearization talks, the North Korean regime decisively snubbed an offer from US officials to meet up anytime, anywhere. Now, this was confusing as the North dictator Kim Jong-un appeared to suggest he was preparing for engagement as well as confrontation with the US amid speculation that he needs to make a deal to lift global sanctions, which together with the pandemic has been critically squeezing the regime. To make sense of these mixed messages and the economic situation in North Korea, we turn to Ramon Pacheco Pardo, reader in international relations at King's College London and KFEUB career chair at the Brussels School of Governance. We also connect with Han Arin, researcher at the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. A warm welcome to you both. And let's start with you, Dr. Pacheco Pardo. Now, after Kim Jong-un seemed to signal that North Korea might be up for talks, it seems that Pyongyang is now giving Washington the cold shoulder, indicating that they aren't so interested after all. What do you make of this recent development? I think that in the short term, we are not going to see any talks. We have seen North Korea close its borders uh, since last year. So I don't think that they are ready uh, to come out and have discussions with the uh, uh, U.S. Or, or with South Korea, for for, for that matter, uh, I don't think that the door is uh, open uh, for negotiations because the leader Kim Jong Un uh, made that clear, and ultimately he's the one who who will decide uh, whether negotiations are going to take place with the U.S. or not. Uh, but I do think we will still have to wait a, a, a few months until the situation is better in North Korea uh, with regards to to, to 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 the pandemic and North Korea opening up its, its borders to avoid the pandemic. Uh, with sufficient controls to avoid the pandemic coming into the country. So, so I don't think we'll have talks in the short term, but I think that eventually the Biden administration and the Kim Jong-un regime uh, will sit down uh, and engage in negotiations. And well, this all comes amid uh, more and more reports emerging that the North Korean economy has been battered by the pandemic and international sanctions. And Ms. Han, the uh, Daily NK estimates that food prices have been skyrocketing there and the North Korean currency has been appreciating 30 to 40 percent against the US dollar and the uh, Chinese renminbi. How volatile do you think prices are in North Korea right now? And also, how do you estimate the level of damage that the North Korean um, economy has really incurred over the course of the pandemic? Yes. Uh, so when it comes to the, the, the soaring food prices, we have a limited um, number of data in regards to the, uh, the number of the foods that we can actually estimate the price. And those uh, data are mostly from Daily NK, the newspaper that is um, uh, run by some of the uh, defectors from the North. And it has been um, you know, kind of estimated that the pork price has risen about like by 57 percent and the corn price has risen as well. And the, the reason why the pork and the corn right, uh, the prices are rising, it are to be um, are to be like speculated that um, some of the influence, the, sw the mostly African swine flu that kind of a swipe the female swine species uh, in North Korea that kind of made it impossible to breed the uh, small um, pigs. Uh, that's why the price of the pork has gone up. And some of the speculations from the researchers across the uh, North Korean studies have said that it might be possible the North Korean authorities are, have been controlling the price of the pork and the corn, but um, these uh, price control activities are not showing any great, um, are not reaping any success in terms of it. As far as the corn is concerned, uh, most of the, the price soaring up uh, is caused by the, uh, the flooding and the typhoons uh, cost last year, I guess, um, and and of course the heat waves and some of the um, the cold waves that hit pretty hard uh, in North Korea at the very beginning of this this year. Um, mostly, so the pork, uh, corn, rice um, are the are um, kind of affected by the the weather, and some of the influenza that are kind of a natural um, external shocks rather than just you know having some sort of a um, any. But it's not really indicating that you know, you know it is. It's not indicating that the uh, the authorities are losing control over any of those prices or are controlling the people. It's just saying um, there might be some sort of um kind of a fluctuations in terms of prices and and food. 
Um, also, you mentioned about the uh, the exchange rates volatility uh, within North Korea. It has been spotted. I mean, until 2019, it was kind of kind of stable until the very end. But it was the volatility was kind of started to be conspicuous starting from 2020. So the, there are two major sources of the exchange rates data, which is one of them uh, is Daily NK, and the other one is Asian Press. So they uh, they show they sometimes show kind of um, contrasting data. So for example, when the XR kind of shows appreciation in Daily NK, sometimes AP to us shows the otherwise. So we didn't really see the consistency of the data. So we well, this, but that's all we had. Uh, we've got. So we relied on those both data and to see and kind of try to see what happened with it. But then, uh, but then, but by the end of um, 2020, they showed a consistency in terms of like, you know, uh, North Korean won appreciating, appreciating against the Chinese beyond at the end of 2020. So uh, mostly that's because uh, the Chinese Wien's depreciation in the first up to first half of the 2020 by the People's Bank of China. Well, which led to, which is kind of allegedly led to the depreciation of the U.S. dollars uh, within North Korea. So in turn, that means uh, the appreciation of the North Korean won. So the there is an argument that it, it is kind of a result of um, kind of a price control or exchange rate control by the North Korean authorities, based upon the fact that you know prices, uh, no official exchange rate has been shared by the authorities since June of 2020, which means we don't actually know that uh, the the official exchange rate that is, uh, has been announced by the, uh, the, the authorities of the North Korea. So we are not really sure. Um, and there has been a huge discrepancy between um, uh, no, not discrepancy, but the gap up between the ex, uh, the exchange rates of the North Korea and the world market are widening. So there are two evidences that indicate that, that uh, the XR has been controlled by the authorities, but it's also on a speculation. Right. So uh, there's been a lot of bad news for North Korea over the past year in terms of its um, economy and the uh, standard of the and it's an impact on people's livelihoods, the impact that uh, global mm -hmm. sanctions and the pandemic has had. And uh, Dr. Pacheco Pardo, now, um, North Korea's ruling party recently, uh, they held their third plenary session of this year. And it's quite a lot compared to previous years when they averaged um, around two annually. And there were all these reports about uh, just the domestic issues that they've been having, given the pandemic, of course, the sanctions and also, uh, more news of crackdowns on uh, North Koreans uh, related to Korean and Western culture. So what do you make of all of this? Does this indicate to you that there's some uh, there's a growing level of instability within the regime? I, I wouldn't say instability because we have no data point to indicate this, but I, I, I do think that clearly the Kim Jong-un regime considers this uh, a potential threat uh, to its rule, to the stability of the regime, in the sense that uh, we do know in other dictatorial regimes, uh, obviously in Central Eastern Europe, uh, Southern Europe, uh, Middle East and North Africa as well, that when change comes, normally it is because of domestic pressure. So we don't have an indication that this is happening in North Korea, but then we didn't have an indication that this was happening, for example, in places such as the, the Soviet Union uh, until it happened. So the issue here is that uh, Kim Jong-un, his regime, will have to improve the economic livelihood of his own population to ensure his continuous uh, and dominance of the country and to ensure that it continues to be in power. So with the pandemic, we have seen the border close uh, with China. Uh, and I would expect that uh, the Kim Jong-un regime is trying to do as much as possible uh, to prevent foreign ideas to continue to filter uh, into the country unless until the situation improves, the economic life of ordinary North Koreans improves and the regime itself and Kim Jong-un himself feels more secure in power. And Ms. Han, now Kim Jong-un has been uh, pursuing the Pyongyun line policy, but uh, I mean, trying to really boost the North Korean economy in addition to its nuclear weapons development. But the economic policy, though, it clearly hasn't taken off over the past few years. So at this point, what would you say are the most realistic options uh, for the North Korean regime, which has seen its economy uh, very much battered over the past year? And how much can they really achieve without curbing global sanctions? 
So uh, before the pandemic, uh, the North Korea was trying to kind of muddle through the sanctions uh, that they were imposed upon. Uh, they were trying to diversify their um, sources of import, and uh, other than those like three Northeast Asian, uh, Northeast um, Chinese provinces, and uh, they were trying to uh, import um, those like uh, the commodities that were not uh, against the sanctions. So they were trying to like you know diversify their economy kind of structure and industrial structures to adjust to the sanctions that uh, they have never um, faced before. But now for now, um, the pandemic is something some, some something else. It's it's not like uh, the sanctions that you know kind of gives some sort of, sort of a room to kind of navigate through the um, the, the predicament. It's the pandemic uh, ca caused North Korea to close all of its borders. And Kim Jong Un seems to have put much weight on protecting the nation from the virus than the economic gains from the trade. In 2019, the um, the fall of the export and import um, was kind of um, um, acceptable. I mean, it was it declined for um, significantly, but that doesn't mean. Uh, but compared to the, uh, the the export and import that declined over the last year because of the pandemic, was uh, was not comparable at all. Um, and thinking, considering the fact that there are the open three major sources of the North Korea's income, which are export to China, and uh, the the income from the dispatched labor, and the group of tourists from coming from China, uh, what North Korea actually can do in the pandemic situation is kind of limited. Um, so, for for instance, uh, so the biggest source of but among those like three major incomes of North Korea, uh, the export to China uh, takes a large account of it. It's like most most of the, its trade is focused on China, and a dispatch labor have returned uh, to return home by the um, almost like almost every dispatch labor from North Korea has returned home by the end of 2019, which was on order from the um, sanctions. So there are as much income that they can gain from the dispatch labor, and some of them. Uh, are not are not reported to have come back home yet because of the pandemic and the uh, the border closures, and foreign tourists obviously from China cannot enter the country at all because of the clo uh, the borders were closed. So the the only income that they can get officially is exports to China, which is blocked by China, uh, blocked by the sanctions and of course this uh, pandemic as well. For now, I guess there is much room, but um, uh, for them now. Uh, for them now. So all I have to say is that the pandemic issue has to be dealt with first in order to gain some economic um, mm -hmm. prosperity. Yeah. And well, Dr. Pacheco, what do you think? I mean, what do you think Kim Jong Un's foreign policy priorities are at the moment as he struggles with these uh, multiple crises in public health, economy, and food shortages? Well, well, I think the moment, uh, of, of course, he's uh, trying to deal with the pandemic and he's trying to secure vaccines like uh, like every other government, really, uh, across the world. This is a challenge for North Korea uh, because uh, the delivery of vaccines, for example, through uh, the COVAX uh, system requires some transparency, uh, probably requires the presence of uh, uh, foreign doctors, foreign nurses uh, that come uh, and develop the implementation of the program. Uh, and North Korea is far less transparent than other developing countries that are more willing to accept uh, foreign assistance. So I think that North Korea will try to gain access to uh, the vaccines uh, through the system if possible, but without uh, opening the country to the extent that other developing countries will be willing to do. Uh, once the pandemic uh, hopefully is over, or when the situation is better, uh, I will assume that uh, the Kim Jong-un regime, North Korea, will sit down uh, with the US, uh, potentially also with South Korea, because it will need to reduce economic dependence on China. And this can only be achieved uh, with sanctions relief, or at the very least with, very least with ex ex exemptions. And this can only happen if there is an agreement uh, with the United States in which North Korea at least agrees to take steps towards denuclearization. Uh, but I think we'll have to wait for this uh, a few months uh, until the situation is better. And crucially, uh, until North Korea starts receiving vaccines, and the regime itself, the government, uh, feels uh, more secure, feels safer, and is willing to engage in diplomacy and potentially also uh, start reopening the border and, and, and travel to overseas. And Dr. Pacheco Pardo, what do you think uh, 
the Americans and the North Koreans are each hoping to get from engagement once it does happen. Do you think they're going to be on the same page in terms of expectations or at least uh, begin, and begin at the same starting point on negotiations? I think the starting point will be different, but I think there is a deal uh, to be done. Uh, the U.S., of course, will demand uh, full denuclearization because no U.S. government can demand anything different. But we have seen how the Biden administration has a more realistic approach. Uh, they are talking about potentially an arms control deal, even if this is an interim uh, a step. And I think that North Korea would be willing to, to agree to this. And we saw in the Hanoi summit uh, between Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un that North Korea seemed to be willing to give up uh, parts of its nuclear weapons program in exchange for sanctions relief. Uh, and this is the other part here. North Korea will demand uh, sanctions relief uh, to begin with. Potentially, there is assumption uh, on agreement to, to allow South Korea to resume inter-Korean economic uh, projects. And we'll have to see whether the U.S. agrees to this. And I think in the U.S. there are two points of view. One of them says uh, we should give them as soon as possible as a goodwill gesture because, you know, you can always, uh, for example, give uh, exemptions uh, to South Korea and then uh, the sanctions can be uh, imposed again, right? The, the snapback uh, clause of the sanctions. But there's another point of view, which is uh, this uh, concession on this uh, part of the U.S. should only come later in the process. And I'm not entirely sure that North Korea would actually agree to this. He will want sanctions relief, if not up front, uh, very early in the process uh, that might take place uh, with the U.S. Well, I suppose we'll have to wait and see after the pandemic is somewhat over. And well, I'm afraid we're out of time, so this is where we'll have to leave um, the discussion today. But that was Ramon Pacheco, Pardo Reader in International Relations at King's College London and Career Chair at the Brussels School of Governance and Hannah Lim, Researcher at the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. Thank you very so much for your insights today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.